I welcome everyone to our leaders' development uh, meeting tonight. And I pray the Lord will develop everything we need so that this work will prosper in your hands. Yeah. Prosper in our hands. Yeah. Our church will grow. Yeah. Your church will grow. Yeah. Location church, district church, group church, region church, the state church, the church in Nigeria will go strong in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We bless your name. We thank you for the joy of meeting together. Thank you for the face of your people. Thank you for fellowship. We're asking, Lord, that in the fellowship tonight, as we look at your word together, you increase the face of everyone. I will march forward and we move on to do exploits for the glory of your name in Jesus' name. Whatever you know we need in our personal lives, in our families, in our leadership role, everything that you know we need to make a success of our life and existence here on earth, grant to everyone tonight impart divine virtue to every life tonight we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray we're coming to hebrews chapter 11 tonight and i'm reading from verse 6 hebrews 11 reading from verse 6 but without faith it's impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That first line again, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Underline those words, to please him. He has called us so that will please him. I'm reading from Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Galatians 1, 10. For do I now seek, do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Hey, you know, Paul, the apostle, talking about his calling, about his ministry, and about the impact of that ministry. And he's asking, in that ministry, in that outreach, in that evangelistic program, or project, or schedule, was he seeking to please men? Or was he seeking to please God himself? Now he said, if I yet pleased men, I shouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I will not be qualified, I'll be disqualified to be a servant of the Lord, pleasing God. First Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 4. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 4. But as we are allowed of God, to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. Again, he mentions the necessity of pleasing the Lord. Tonight, we're looking at the message, the essence of pleasing God in life and ministry the essence of pleasing god in life and ministry the reason for our existence is to please god the essence of our life is to please god the calling we have received the ministry is to please god the evidence of love that we love god as he demands, loving him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, 
that law has its evidence in pleasing the Lord. And the result of Christian experiences, the Christian experience of salvation, the Christian experience of sanctification, purity of heart, the Christian experience of the baptism immersion in the Holy Ghost, the essence of those experiences and the outcome, the impact, the result of those experiences is that we are prepared to please the Lord, the pursuit of heaven-bound believers. Somebody is saved, and from that point of salvation, is pursuing, wanting to get to heaven, and is heaven-bound. The pursuit of such a person, heaven-minded, is that he wants to please the Lord. And now, the very focus of ministry for the servants of God, for the people of God, the focus of that ministry is pleasing the Lord. And yet we're told, without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. And so you understand, a very life, a very existence, a very Christian experience, everything that comes together to please the Lord demands faith. Because without faith, we cannot have those experiences. And without faith, we cannot please the Lord. The natural man cannot please the Lord. The unsaved man cannot please the Lord. The one that is still unconverted in his natural, carnal, human nature. He cannot please the Lord. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The very foundational experience of pleasing the Lord is conversion. Because this one in the flesh cannot please the Lord. And as we minister, as we help people, and we, you know, the important thing is for them, the people who are ministering to, to please the Lord. And yet, without that foundational experience of salvation, of conversion, of transformation by grace, it's impossible to please the Lord. Religious people, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, traditional people, like those who are addicted to religion. And then the people that are just worshipping, and they worship in various places, they might even hold some doctrines of the Bible that are actually true to the Bible, but if they're traditional, if they're only religious, they cannot please the Lord. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 15. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus, the chief priests, Caiaphas, Annas, and all those Pharisees, and all those Jews, so deeply religious, they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us they please not God and are contrary to all men they please not God because they are contrary to the plan of God they are contrary they, they are in the opposition to the will of God until sin and self are dealt with until the sinner comes to the cross and surrenders himself and he yields up and he gives up all his sins and he receives Jesus as his Lord and personal Savior. He cannot please the Lord. And until the believer comes and then he takes self, the I, the ego, the natural self in man, 
until he lays that at the altar. He cannot please the Lord fully. We're told in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 2, reading here from verse 6. Therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east. And as so says, like the Philistines, they please themselves. They have not given up self. They have not crucified self. They have not abandoned self. They please themselves in the children of strangers. And until that is done, that self is given up, totally given up, we cannot fully, completely, entirely please the Lord. Even though somebody might even become a recognized leader, a known leader, look at Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14, the position itself does not make us please the Lord. There is something that must take place. Sin must be dealt with. Self must be dealt with. And we must totally abandon ourselves unto God. Totally submit ourselves, surrender ourselves to the Lord. And then we we'll begin a lie that is pleasing unto the Lord. Judges chapter 14 verse 3. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Remember that the children of Israel were told they should not marry from those nations that are to be cast out. Just like the Lord has given us the commandment, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because what concord, what agreement, what fellowship, what understanding has the believer with the unbeliever? And as the parents pointed out, the father pointed out, this is not right. You see, if self has not been dealt with, the position of a worker, of a minister, of a leader, does not just naturally, automatically lead us to pleasing the Lord. Look at what something said, and something said to his father, Get her for me. Tell me what follows there. I can't hear you. Use the preacher's voice and tell me. For she pleased me well. May not please the Father, may not please our Heavenly Father, may not please God, may not please the teachers of the Word of God, but she pleased me well. That's the problem with those who have not come into this fullness of faith. Those who have not come into this manifestation of the kind of faith that deals with sin in its entirety and deals with self in its completeness. Now, faith is what helps us. We're coming back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading here from verse 5. It says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Look at this. For before his translation, he had this testimony that, that what? That, tell me out aloud, that he pleased God. And now after telling us the example of Enoch, that he walked with God and he pleased God, he now tells us it's not just for Enoch. If we're going to have 
a good relationship with the Lord as members of the body of Christ, as ministers, as preachers, pastors, and teachers of the word, there is one thing that is necessary, must be uppermost in our hearts. We must endeavor, we must pray, and we must addict ourselves to pleasing the Lord. That's why it now says in verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith brings us to the position of pleasing the Lord, saving faith. That means then, as that faith transforms us and brings the grace of God into our lives, into our hearts, it gives us the mind of Christ. He, the Son of God, grants us through that saving faith to become the children of God. And then we have the disposition, we have the decision, we have the devotion, we have the direction in our lives of wanting to please God and God alone. And then will the Lord have testimony concerning us that will please him. I pray that the same testimony the Father had concerning the Lord Jesus Christ will have concerning you in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 3, reading from verse 17. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 and low. A voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That should be the testimony of God concerning you. It will be. I said it will be. Matthew chapter 17, reading from verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, the bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, the voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And this is the secret in John chapter 8, verse 29. John chapter 8, verse 29. Here are the words of Jesus. We're listening to the Father, testifying concerning the son and now the son is telling us he's going to tell us why that voice came in john chapter 8 verse 29 and he that sent me is with me the father has not let me alone for i do what's the next word there i do tell me out aloud always always those things that what Please him. That can become a statement, a testimony, a fact concerning you. How will that happen? In Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. As you have that mind of Christ, that nature of Christ, then you go the same direction as Christ. And the same thing that walked inside him, that by the Spirit he lived and he walked to please the Lord. You will live, you will walk to please the Lord in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. As we come to the Lord, 
at that initial point of salvation, we needed that initial faith. As you hear the word of God that challenges you and is demanding of you more than repentance because now you have repented, something else comes as the greater instruction and the greater demand and the greater challenge and the greater commandment of God comes to you, you need to step up that faith, increase our faith. As you hear about sanctification, we're not going beyond salvation. The higher the calling and the greater the load and the greater the demand, the greater the faith we will need so that as you have greater assignment and you have greater demand and you have greater consecration, then your faith also keeps on increasing and then persecution might come. And as the persecution comes, and you want to be an overcomer, I see overcomers here tonight. I said I see overcomers there tonight. To overcome, this one, the things you did not even bargain for. You didn't know they will happen. As those things come upon your life, then your faith is increasing until whatever challenge comes at any point in your Christian life. At any point in your Christian ministry, you need the same faith that will match that challenge of the day so that you'll keep on pleasing the Lord. It's at the point where the faith breaks down that now I have a challenge today I didn't have yesterday, a challenge this week I didn't have last week, a challenge this year I didn't have the previous year, and then I'm still carrying the faith of last year, but the Lord is greater. The mountain is bigger. The persecution is more intense. And the challenge is greater than what I faced before. And now I'm approaching the problem of today, the challenge of today, and the demand of today with the face of five years ago. Then everything breaks down. But you know, as your faith keeps on matching the problem, and matching the mountain, and matching the challenge, then you'll be pleasing God every moment of your life. I'm talking to people who are going to please God more and more. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, thank God our God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Three things we're looking at, I've told you the topic already, the essence of pleasing God in life, and in ministry. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the life of faith that pleases God. The life of faith that pleases God. Point number two, the love in fullness that pleases God. That's the life that pleases God. That's the love in fullness that pleases God. Number three, the labor for the flock that pleases God. The labor for the flock that pleases God. We're coming to point number one, the life of faith that pleases God. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading from verse four. By faith, Abel offered to God, unto God, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You know that both of them actually offered to the Lord, but Cain offered the fruit of the ground, the work of his own hand, what he has produced, and remember the earth had been cursed. In chapter 3, and all those uh, things that he brought, they were actually under the curse, and it's like he was bringing cursed material to eradicate and to remove and to take away the curse upon him that's why he was not answered but abel abel offered unto god a more acceptable sacrifice and we're told that by that he obtained righteousness testifying to his gifts 
and he being dead yet speaketh. Look at the number one quality in his uh, offering. Chapter 9 of uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. That's why Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. And that's why many people today who are offering any other thing to God apart from the blood of Jesus Christ for their salvation. That's why they cannot be saved. But when you come and you remember the word, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And you say, I come to take refuge. I come to have regeneration. I come to have redemption in the blood of Jesus that was shed for me. Then God answers your prayer and you are regenerated and you are saved and you are born again because without the shedding of blood is no remission. Come to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. You understand the major thing we're told about this man Enoch is that he walked with God. He walked with God. Walking with God. Walking with God. And walking consistently. Walking without interruption. You know the time he lived, it was the time of the corruption of the world. And yet, in spite of the corruption, in spite of the defilement all around, in spite of the contradiction of sinners all around him, he kept his eyes on the goal and kept on walking with God and walking with God without backsliding. You will not backslide. Genesis chapter 5 reading from verse 22 Genesis chapter 5 verse 22 and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and he begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God you'll walk with God walking in the light, walking in righteousness, and walking in according to the will of God, Enoch walked with God, and it was not for God took him. Rapture. You'll have part in that rapture. Amos chapter 3. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed Enoch was in agreement with God. Everything God said, he said, yes, you are always right. And he followed after God. The doctrine, just what God demanded. The life, just what God demanded. And the direction of his life. The thing to separate from and the thing to affiliate with just what God has demanded. Because two cannot work together except they be agreed i pray you'll always be in agreement with god no contradiction no opposition no disagreement whatever he says you say whatever he demands you do whatever direction he wants you to go you go it is that constant agreement with god daily agreement with god practical agreement with God that makes us to please the Lord walking in with the Lord in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 1 furthermore we beseech you brethren and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God. Do you see those two things joined together? Walking with God and pleasing God. 
agreement with God and pleasing God. Living according to the revelation of the word of God and pleasing God. It says, as you have received the force, how you ought to walk. And to please God, so ye would abound more and more. You will in Jesus' name. You see, as we talk about this uh, walking with God, it demands faith, but it must be lively faith. It must be active faith. It must be dynamic faith. Dead faith, like a dead child, will not please anyone. A child is dead. That child does not have the same value, the same affection that the living children have in the heart of the parents. Dead faith does not please God. Dumb faith does not please God. What's dumb faith? I believe God, but God is speaking, he cannot hear. It's dumb, it's deaf. Deaf faith cannot please God. Dormant faith, the faith that just lies there, it's like, look at my hand, and the hand is hanging down, withered, paralyzed, inactive, passive. That kind of hand cannot do anything because it's dormant. The same thing about faith. If the faith is dead, if the faith is dumb, if the faith is deaf, if the faith is dormant, if the faith is devilish, Look at James chapter 2. In James chapter 2, all these would displease the Lord. If the faith is man-centered, confidence in man, no confidence in God. Faith in man, no faith in God. Trust in man, no trust in God. If the faith is man-centered, if the faith is self-centered, me, 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 confidence in myself. And then I go my own way. And I'm not looking at the way of God, that kind of faith, that kind of trust, that kind of confidence in ourselves. Without the faith and the trust and the confidence in God will displease God. We're looking at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 17. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, action, evidence, is dead, being alone. It's saying, even so, our hand, if the hand does not have any movement, does not have any action, you cannot lift it up, you cannot put it down. You cannot try it with it, although it's there, but then it's worthless because it's dead, because it's dormant, and because it is inactive and passive. Look at verse 19. The believest that there is one God, thou doest well. But you must remember this, the devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe and tremble. It says, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works, faith without corresponding action, faith without practical activity, faith without evidence, faith without oppression, is dead. Look at verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works, without corresponding action, is dead also. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading here from verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11. We're reading from verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. Things not seen as yet. Rain falling. They've never seen that at that time. And becoming a flood, it had never happened until that time. 
and then a flood that is high enough to sweep people away it had not happened by that time and when God spoke to him it's like God has spoken to us now about heaven and we have not seen heaven and yet we believe he has spoken about a hell to avoid a hell to shun we have not seen it and yet we believe he has spoken about the Lord coming it will appear in the sky and there will be the shout and the trumpet of the Lord. And the Lord himself shall descend and the dead in Christ shall rise. We have not seen it and yet we know it will happen. Noah had not seen that, that the rain will come and that it was necessary to build the ark. Yet he wasn't choosing his reasoning. He wasn't choosing. You know, it's a faculty of what I know about history. What I know about events that have happened before. That's why it says by faith, Noah, being warned of God, one by God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. It says by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness which is by faith the righteousness that moved him the action he took was an action that followed the words of god that have been given to him not walking by sight but walking by faith we're told in hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. There's a kind of fear that goes along with faith in God. He wants us of judgment and we believe that. We know a day of judgment is coming. And because of that faith in the word of God, we we'll fear the judgment that is to come. And that faith and that fear of the judgment to come makes us to reverence God, honor God, run after God, pursue everything the Lord wants us to pursue. And our faith then is demonstrated like the faith of Noah. Welcome to Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he didn't know the place. It's like leaving the known for the unknown. It's like leaving what you're familiar with and then you're going to what you're not familiar with and yet we're told he obeyed and he went out tell me the rest of that sentence and he went out you know I'm going to ask you again once again that's not good enough he went out tell me out aloud not knowing whither he went. You understand that? He didn't say seeing is believing. Show it to me. Where am I going? Where am I getting to? What am I going to have? What are the rewards? He didn't know all that. And yet you bid the Lord. I pray God will give us that kind of singular demonstration, concentration, confirmation of faith in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 51. In Isaiah chapter 51, here I'm reading from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 2. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone. God said, I'd never called anybody like that before. 
he couldn't find an example he was going to lean on he couldn't find something that had been recorded okay so and so did it like that such and such did it like that i must do it like that too the god and the grace that helps so and so will help me he didn't have anything to refer to like that i called him alone and he didn't have a pastor did it have a counselor? Did it have a teacher? I called him alone. He didn't have somebody to encourage him to go alongside by his side and say, you can do it. You can do it. It can be done. And yet he obeyed the Lord with all the encouragements we have, with all the grace we have, and with all the examples we have. Thank God we can do it. And thank God you will do it. Look unto Abraham your father. And unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and I blessed him, and I increased him. In Hebrews chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, we're looking at verse 11. It says, Through faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And she was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. That tells us how we too can walk by faith, how we too can live by faith. We focus attention on him. We focus our hearts on him. We focus a decision on him. We are linked with him by an inseparable, unbreakable cord. When we are weak, we know he is strong. When it appears, we don't know the way. He knows the way. We judge him faithful who has promised. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 let us hold fast the profession of our faith the declaration of our faith i believe god hold on to that hold it fast i know with god all things are possible hold it fast analyze that interpret that apply that yourself i know that i know with god all things are possible I believe that Jesus Christ has all power on earth and in heaven. And then he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Analyze that. Believe that. Apply that. And hold fast the profession of your faith. The declaration of your faith. The pronouncement of your faith. The testimony of your faith. Without wavering. Look at what we have in the bracket there. The reason why we do that is because we know that he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. Only faith in God through Christ's atoning sacrifice pleases God. And we found the case of Abel, the case of Enoch, the case of Noah, the case of Abraham, and the case of Sarah, and these uh, people, all in Genesis, they please the Lord, Isaac, all in Genesis, Jacob, all in Genesis, and Joseph, all in Genesis. They please the Lord, even at that early stage of human history, because they had faith in God. It is faith that turns us God watch. It turns us away from everything else unto God. And it turns us away from sin unto the Savior, from self unto the sanctifier, from the world unto the Lord, turns us away from the devil and turns us to the conqueror and the captain of our salvation. That faith turns us away from any object, every object, that faith turns us away from every personality and it turns us to Christ. Christ alone for your eternal 
destiny. Now we come to point number two. The love in a fullness that pleases God. The love in fullness that pleases God. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. What happened to Enoch? He loved God so much. He decided at the age of 65 that now I'm going to live for God. I'm going to live like God wants. I'm going to walk with God. One week after he didn't change his mind, a year after he didn't change his mind, 300 years he didn't change his mind. And God had to make a special provision. Even though God had said, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, humanity was doomed to die. That death was pronounced on the whole of humanity. But God translated him that he should not see death. He loved God. If anybody ever loved God, that man loved God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Reading here from verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 10. We're reading from verse 12. It tells us in verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in how many of his ways? Tell me out aloud. Tell me as if that's what you are going to do. To walk in all his ways. That's what you know did. He walked in all the ways that were revealed unto him. He didn't say, uh, uh that's not important. He didn't say, I'm going to sweet sift. I'm going to choose. I'm going to select. This is all right for me. This one, I don't understand this. But he walked with God in all his ways. To love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 6. What happened to Enoch? Something must have happened because a man that has the Adamic leaning, Adamic disposition, Adamic nature, Adamic rebellion, Adamic depravity in him cannot just be walking with God, walking with God like that. Something happened. To make him to walk with God and to love God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind. Whatever it is that happened to him will happen to you. Are we going to make the rapture? Are we going to see the Lord on the final day? If we're not walking with God, if we're falling and rising, if we're not steadfast, if we're not consistent. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. And the heart of thy seed was the purpose to love the Lord thy God. When that circumcision takes place, when that Adamic depravity is taken away, then it makes us to love him with all our heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. If it has not happened it will happen. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they, is talking about all the people we've read about, they, is talking about Abraham, is talking about those Old Testament worthies, 
citizens of the kingdom of God, but now they desire a better country that is and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Far back in Genesis, they knew, Abraham knew, that there was a better place, a greater place, a more honorable place, a more beautiful place than this place on earth. That's why his mind was never looking back. Should I go back? Should I rethink my decision? Should I adjust my obedience? In fact, you remember, when a wife was to be sought for Isaac, look at Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis chapter 24, we read from verse 6, you will see his mind are totally separated from the past. He didn't have any mind of if things are not going well, if things are not like I expect, then I will go back. No, not at all. He was moving forward. You'll move forward. You'll be steadfast in moving forward. Decisive in moving forward. You will not go back in Jesus' name. Amen. In Genesis chapter 24, we're looking at verse 6. Genesis chapter 24, reading from verse 6. And Abraham said unto him, The chief servant of his house, Beware that thou bring not my son. See that again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred. He took me. He took me away from there. And there's no mind of going back. And which spake unto me, that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send this angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, marriage is not do or die. Marriage is not, if it doesn't happen, okay, we'll go back there. Marriage is not like, if it doesn't happen today, this week, or this year, then we have to reconsider consecration. And the parents that are so insistent, and they're so serious about, my child must marry this time. Look at her age, look at his age. And they will encourage their children Bring anybody you want. Whether the fellow is saved, sanctified or not, I don't worry about that now. Bring anybody you want. Abraham was not like that. He said, if that woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. That was the faith of Abraham. And that was the commitment of Abraham. And those worthies of all the love they had for the Lord. They demonstrated it. Look at Genesis chapter 22. Reading here from verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the Lord did test, tried, tempt Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Look at how definite God was to Abraham. He'd been waiting for that, Isaac, for 25 years. From the age of 75, and he had him at the age of 100. And God now said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a bunch offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. It was a test, but God did not say, Abraham, don't worry about this. Testing, testing, testing. No, not at all. Abraham thought it was for real. Abraham thought God demands this child as a bunch offering, but he believed. 
that God will raise him up. You see, a person following God like that, that's love. He loved God before the icy. And there might be an Isaac in your life. There might be that solitary thing in your life. You love very much. You've been waiting for that thing for so many years. And now you are to lay it on the altar for the Lord. It's a test of your faith. It's a test of your love. And we're told in verse 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he saddled his ass, and he took two of his young men with him, and I seek a son, and he claimed the wood for the bunch of Rehina, and rose up, and he went unto the place of the which God had told him. He went to that same place. You know, sometimes sorrow can make you to be absent minded. You know, sometimes a surprising information has come. A demand has come, and then you become absent minded. God is demanding something, demanding your Isaac. And he says, By faith, Abraham offered Isaac. And he wasn't absent minded because of sorrow, because there's a great challenge, there's a great mountain. And this is a great demand on my faith, on my love for God. He took Isaac, he took the knife, he took the wood, and he took what will make uh, the fire weave. And he got those two servants, you know the story. And he went to the place that God had told him. Look at verse 16. And said, this God talking to him now, back up to verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said by myself have I sworn says the Lord for because thou hast done the sin and hast not withheld thy son thine only son that in blessing I will bless thee. There are many people wanting to claim verse 17. They don't go through verse 16. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The love in fullness that pleases the Lord. It goes on to say in verse 18. And in thy sea shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because, tell me because of what? Because, tell me out aloud, thou hast obeyed my voice. Those were the people of old. That's how they demonstrated the love in fullness that pleased the Lord. We're coming to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading here from verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24. By faith, Moses. Have you noticed all these people, Old Testament worthies? You just see all their actions in the Old Testament, all their deeds in the Old Testament, and the description of their following after the Lord in the Old Testament. But now we're told it's because of their faith, the foundation of their faith, the pivot of their faith, the strength and the support underneath their lives it was their living faith it was their dynamic faith it was their abiding faith that made them to do everything we have read about and it tells us in this verse 24 it says by faith moses when he was come to years he refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter underline that word refused 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 here is something that anybody will jump at a political position here is something anybody will jump at the possibility of becoming an egyptian emperor later in life here is something anybody will jump at the highest position ever given to even an egyptian the greatest empire at that time but Moses said, I have faith in God. 
have faith in God. I'm going to be, I am called to be a deliverer for the children of Israel. Israel did not even know that at that time. And yet he said, I will be. But there's something you still need to understand. He refused. Somebody tell me out aloud, he refused. Tell me out aloud, he refused. Look at Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And I'm reading from verse 10. Exodus chapter 32 verse 10. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, against the children of Israel, that I may consume them. Look at this, look at this. And I will make of thee a great nation. This is something even greater than becoming the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This is something you know, greater than being an emperor, being a king, being a pharaoh over Egypt. This is the almighty God himself telling Moses, saying, let me alone. Let my anger wax hot against these disobedient, rebellious children of Israel. And then I'm going to start with you. I will make you of you a great nation. Again, he refused. He refused by faith, by faith, by faith, he refused something great coming to him. But because of his love for the people of God, his love for the almighty God himself, look at verse 11, and Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. That's what you told Abraham. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Moses refused. A great opportunity, a great chance, a great reward for the expense of having the children of Israel wiped out. And he said, no, Lord, I don't want that. I will not receive that. That's the faith we're talking about. The faith that's able to give up something you know, for the glory of God. We're coming back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm reading here from verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer. He chose rather to suffer. That's faith. That's faith. Choosing rather to suffer. It was not imposed on him. This was his personal choice. That I'm choosing this way. I hear the call and I surrender to it voluntarily of my free volition. He said, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. There comes the time in your life when there are two alternatives. Go this way, no, there will be no problem. Everything will be fine. You'll have honor. The world will respect you. And people that know about you will honor you. But choose this other one. This one, you'll have joy in eternity. Reward in eternity. And you will have the privilege of delivering many souls out of the kingdom of darkness. 
but it's going to come with some persecution. It's going to come with some of your relatives, some of the members in your family, not fully understanding your choice. And then you make your choice and you do that. Like Moses who made that choice, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You'll make a wise choice. You'll make a better choice. You won't be looking at, does it have pain? Does it have problem? Does it have suffering? Does it have persecution? Does it have any challenge? That will not be your consideration. Does it have the glory of God? Is it going to deliver thousands and millions of people from the shackles of sin and Satan? Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 13. I have chosen personal. I have chosen well considered. I have chosen. I've considered all the alternatives. I've considered all the possibilities. I know what it will bring. I know the suffering it might bring. I know I might not be able to do what my people are expecting of me to do. They want me to be the breadwinner. They want me to be the politician. They want me to be this and that. But I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I pray God will give us the courage, will give us the consecration, and will give us a commitment to make the right choice and it happens by faith hebrews chapter 11. hebrews chapter 11 reading from verse 26 esteeming the reproach of christ esteeming the reproach of christ christ was not born yet he looked with the eyes of faith into the future because God had told him and it's recorded in Deuteronomy a prophet shall the Lord raise up like unto Moses in him I will put all my revelation all my word and the people shall obey him and he was looking ahead to that coming of Christ and whatever reproach will come, whatever shame will come, and whatever suffering will come, he already put his shoulder under that load. And he said, Lord, I will. Look at verse 26 again, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect, great evolution and great desire unto the recompense of the reward. That's the attitude the Lord wants us to have. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gauge. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Bearing his reproach. You might be reproached for the name of Christ. You bear that joyfully. You might be dishonored for, for the sake of Christ. You bear that joyfully because you're going unto him. Like Moses, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Like Moses, he chose to suffer for the Lord. And then like Moses, he took over and he bore the reproach. First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 4 verse 14 If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. You'll be happy. 
you'll be joyful in persecution you'll be happy you'll not cry mm. I say you will not cry you see this is coming to me because I'm in Christ because I represent Christ because I'm following Christ that's a reproach and it says if he be reproached for the name of Christ happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part is evil spoken of but on your part he is glorified the Lord will be glorified in your life and through your life in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Now we come to Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm reading here from verse Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 27. Hebrews chapter 11. Reading from verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing he knew how mighty how terrible how dangerous how devilish how deadly pharaoh was because that pharaoh would say any child that is born being a male cast him to the river let them die Leave the ladies alone, the girls alone, so we can marry them, and then you'll forget the nation. He wanted to obliterate. He wanted to totally blot out the remembrance of Israel as a nation. Moses knew he had been in the court. Moses knew he had been in the palace. Moses knew he knew the Pharaoh of that time. How terrible. And yet it says, by faith, I pray God will give us the faith. The faith that believes in God and fears no man, no Pharaoh, no Nebuchadnezzar, and no Herod here on earth. He'll give it to you in Jesus' name. All right. If he'll not give it to you, he'll give it to me. He'll give it to us in Jesus' name. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured a seen him who is tell me there invisible he saw god more than he saw pharaoh he saw god my sight the creator of the heavens and the earth and because of that his faith in god the invisible god made him not to fear pharaoh because it was like you saw the invisible. You will see the invisible. He will be by you. He'll stay by you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And since he's always there, open your eyes of faith and see him. And anytime you see him, you'll not shake. You'll have a backbone. You'll stand firm in your life in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content of such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Any amen on the ground? So that we may boldly say we may confidently say we may courageously say and we may fearlessly say the lord is my helper and i tell me and i say it aloud and i will not fear what man shall do unto me you will not be afraid in Jesus name our church will not be afraid in Jesus name look at Psalm 56 Psalm 56 I'm reading here from verse 4 
Psalm 56, reading from verse 4. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Look at verse 11. In God, have I put my trust. In God, have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. You will not be afraid in Jesus' name. Faith walketh by love. And we have seen the faith of these people of the Old Testament. Faith, trust in the promises of God produced relationship. A loving relationship with the Lord. They so trusted God. They so had confidence in God. And they so related with God that their love was total and entire. They had love in its fullness. And that love in its fullness pleased the Lord. Such love made Enoch and made God to come together and to walk together. Such love made Abraham an intimate friend of God. Such love, total love, complete love, entire love, love that generated out of their implicit faith in the Almighty God, granted Moses special place in God's heart, in God's house, in God's heaven. Without faith, None of us can please God. Without the love that is born out of that faith, no man, no minister, no leader, no pastor can please God. Do what we may, activities. Do what we may, earnestness. Do what we may, zeal. Do what we want to do, sacrifice. Do whatever it is, sweating and perspiration religious deeds or mechanical motion without faith the faith that produces total love we cannot please the lord point number three now the labor for the flock that pleases god the labor over the flock the labor in the flock that pleases god we're coming to hebrews chapter 11 and I'm reading from Versace, Hebrews chapter 11. We're reading here from Versace. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. It says in Versace 2, and what shall I more say? For the time will fail me to tell of Gideon. And to tell of Barak, and to tell of Samson, and to tell of Jephthah, and to tell of David also, and of Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Notice that through faith, these men they fought, they strove, they contended. And they did all that God had called them to do. And through that faith, the faith that labored. See what they did? They subdued kingdoms. And they wrought righteousness. They obtained promises. And they stopped the mouths of lions. The lions did not hinder them to do the will of God. They said, the will of God, number one, there might be lions on the way. There might be a den of lions between them and fulfilling the will of God. But lions or no lions, the will of God was number one. And their faith in God and their commitment to God, their dedication to God and their consecration to God was number one. And in fact, it goes on to say, in verse 34, they quenched the violence of fire. The fire, the furnace, standing between them and the will of God, 
They knew it was there because Nebuchadnezzar said, If you will not bow down to my idol, and then I decide to cast you into the furnace of fire, who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? But they escaped, and God delivered them. You know why? Because they subdued the fear of fire and the fear of the sword and the fear of the most powerful monarch despot in the world at that time in verse 34 they escaped the edge of the sword out of weakness were made strong and they were valiant in fight and they turned to flight the armies of the aliens come back to verse 33 as to sum up all that those people did whatever their name you'll find that they were fighting for the glory of god they were pursuing to labor for the flock that is for the people of israel they served they fought they led the flock of god they taught they preached they counseled they gave exhortation they fed them with the word of god they contended with adversaries they subdued kingdoms they wrought righteousness they wrought wonders they overcame the fury of the tyrant all for the sake of god's elect all for the sake of the flock of god laboring by faith to preserve the nation of israel one word is used for them in verse 33 verse 33 who through faith subdued kingdoms who through faith what did they do who through faith tell me the one there subdued kingdoms look at joshua chapter 18 they subdued the enemy they subdued the powers that would have hindered them from doing the will of god and from getting the people of god preserved god has called us today and whatever stands between us and the goal he has called us to the ministry he has called us to will subdue everything in jesus name tyrants will not stop us despots will not stop us oppressors will not stop us the fire of nebuchadnezzar will not stop us the lion's den will not stop us persecution will not stop us will not stop you will not stop you you will subdue them in jesus name joshua chapter 18 verse 1 joshua chapter 18 verse 1 and the whole congregation of the children of israel assembled together at shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there look at this look at this and the land was subdued before them this is our chance now look at this state look at this nation look at this country look at this continent go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature whatever stands between us and the fulfillment of the great commission we're going to subdue the land judges chapter 11 verse 33 judges chapter 11 verse 33 and he smote them this Jephthah from Aroa even till thou come to Minis even twenty cities and unto the plain of the vineyards with a very great slaughter thus the children of Ammon were tell me the word tell me out aloud subdued before the children of israel that's the word hold on to that word keep that word in your heart have that word in your consecration 
have that watch in your prayer we will subdue this land and we're going to turn the hearts of the people unto God in Jesus name but you know how that happened verse 35 and it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said alas my daughter thou hast brought me very low and for thou art one of them that troubled me for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back that's how they subdued that's how they overcame that's how they did the will of God lions are there I've opened my mouth unto the Lord I cannot go back and then the fire of Nebuchadnezzar look at it burning and look at the face of Nebuchadnezzar full of wrath and anger but you know I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back that's how we're going to subdue the land you are one of the number I said you are one of the number will subdue the land for Christ in Jesus name for Samuel chapter 7 verse 13 for Samuel chapter 7 verse 13 so the Philistines were subdued the Philistines Goliath among them relatives of Goliath among them giants among them we're going to subdue idols we're going to subdue the strange gods we're going to subdue so the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel give me a good amen over there you are the candidate for this victory today by faith it will happen by faith you will stand your ground by faith you will overcome second Samuel chapter 22 I'm reading from verse 40 second Samuel chapter 22 reading from verse 40 for thou has guarded me with strength to battle new strength has come today new power has come today the faith that conquers has come to every one of us today thou has guarded me with strength to battle them that rose up against me as thou as thou as thou subdued under me look at verse 45 there strangers shall submit themselves unto me strangers shall submit themselves unto me read it now strangers shall submit themselves unto me as soon as they hear they shall be obedient unto me that power has now come that authority has now come Daniel chapter 2 Daniel chapter 2 we're reading from verse 40 in Daniel chapter 2 verse 40 and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as the iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things subdueth all things that's the Roman government Roman Empire which is typified here prophesied here at the fourth kingdom that will come and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise but there's the stone the stone of Israel there's the rock of ages his name is Jesus Christ he lives in the believer he lives in me what are you he lives in me I said he lives in me 
and greater is he that lives in you than he that is in the world. Verse 44, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever for as much as thou sowest that stone that was caught out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron the brass the clay the silver the gold the great god of heaven has made known unto the kingdom Cadnesa what shall come to pass hereafter the dream is certain and the interpretation sure we are the fulfillment of that interpretation in Christ. Through us, through you. Through us, through me. Through us, through his church. It will subdue the earth and we go into all the world. And as you go, strangers will bench before you. And strangers will submit themselves unto you. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40. God, having prepared some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Coming from Abel all through to Samuel and the prophets. Look at what they have done. They subdued. And it says, yet we are now the people of God on ground. What they did, we're going to do. More than what they did, we're going to do. God will use you. God will use us by faith to purify his church. To empower his church. To preserve his church. To protect his church, to project his church, and to prosper his church. Through you, through me, through our ministry together, he will perfect his church. He will prepare the church to please God in all things. They did it by faith. We will do it by faith. You believe? Where are you? I said, you believe? Rise up and tell the Lord, by faith, Enoch. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. By faith, Joshua. By faith, all those prophets, they subdued, your own time has come. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, make up your mind, consecrate yourself. Lions will not stop you. The den will not stop you. The fire will not stop you. By faith, go and subdue for the Lord.